What's up, volleyball fans? I'm Darren Tipton, and welcome to the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Our podcast, we will dive deep into the heart of the game, bringing you the hottest topics, prospects, and a buzz surrounding prep and college volleyball, especially the world of recruiting. In each episode, our crew will spotlight rising stars who are shaking up the national game. Plus, we will serve you the scoop on current events that have coaches and fans talking courtside. Tune in for the episodes that spotlight tomorrow's college stars, new trends in the sport, plus interviews that will keep you informed on the explosion that is volleyball in the USA. You can connect with us on social media, Instagram at vbadrenaline.com underscore and Twitter at vbadrenaline. Be part of the conversation. Share your thoughts on your favorite players, prospects, and predictions by using hashtag VBAdrenaline. So grab a seat, volleyball fans, and get ready to dive into the world of spikes, sets, and serves with the VB Adrenaline Podcast. See you there. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome back again. This is uh, Darren Tipton and another episode of the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Uh, be on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast. But today we're joined by, um, I like to call her a colleague. She's a little more famous than I am, but we did start out way back in the day together. Emily Eamon, um, wear of many volleyball hats, but uh, mostly the Big Ten Network and now ESPN. And Emily, thanks for thanks for taking time with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm uh, I'm pumped to be here. Anyone in the volleyball space is a friend, so I'm I'm excited. Yeah, uh, tell people. Well, uh, tell your story, but I I like to tell people the story right when I'm name dropping um, that I know you from the COVID Final Four, <laughs> um, when uh, they put you and I and maybe one other media person um, decided to attend. And we were like 840 feet up in the rafters um, in Omaha. We could literally touch the ceiling. Yeah, it was. I remember being up top and we were actually looking down through the rafters. It was actually obstructing our view of the game. Um, that's how high we were up there. So, yeah, definitely look back at that. And I'm, I'm glad that, one, COVID is no longer um, making it so that we have to be up there. And, two, just happy to you know, be, see the space grow a little bit more to where we can actually be down on the floor. Yeah. I always say dang Nebraska because it didn't, I, I tell people, um, five years ago, six, 2018, uh, my volleyball director at the time, I said, Hey, um, we should see if we can get media passes for the final four. And she's like, whatever. And I'm like, well, it never hurts to ask. And not only did we get media passes in Kansas city that year, we were like, five feet from um, Dave and Karch doing the ESPN broadcast. I'm like, that doesn't happen anymore. There's a couple more requests now than there was in 2018. Yeah, well, in a good way. I mean, I even think back to the national championship this year, and I believe they had to start turning people away, which was, you know, it's obviously unfortunate, but it's also really cool to see the sport growing so much and that they're hitting capacity in terms of how many people are actually allowed to cover it. Yeah, um, and and you had some uh, primetime names this year, but I I just think the environment around the Final Four, um, I've always talked about us pushing for, like, why can't volleyball have what the men's basketball Final Four has and the national championship, you know, football national championship has. And this year, it felt like the fan zone, things like that. Uh, People there an hour before, two hours before the match, it felt like the atmosphere of a championship. Yeah, it did. I think seeing that fan zone outside um, and how many fans were there was one of the coolest things I feel like I'd ever experienced in terms of the volleyball space. You know, I I think back to that 92,000 game earlier in the year at Nebraska, and this kind of had the same vibe of that. You know, you had thousands of fans lining up outside to see their teams walk in. That was, I think, the most um, heightened Final Four that I had seen in terms of coverage and fan support and just excitement around it. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to uh, we'll get back into the, the state of volleyball more in a little bit. But let's go back to your career, um, because to me, when we met, you were literally just getting started with Big Ten Network, correct? Yes. Yeah, that was uh, my first 
I mean, that was my first real stint with Big Ten Network. Um, I actually pitched myself to them to cover that that tournament because they didn't have any digital coverage at the time. Um, so yeah, that was my first kind of go around, um, really, really doing something like that. <clears throat> well, and we, uh, uh, I say, I always like to joke with people that was our first uh, as well. And you've done a lot better job marketing yourself uh, than I have because you've grown just a little bit faster. But talk about that because we do interns. We have interns here uh, that want to get into the space. And it's always can, been part of my mission to improve volleyball content and commentary. You need people who love and know volleyball. Yeah. But, Talk about that from square one. You get done playing at Northwestern. How, you know, pitching yourself. What were those first steps like? Yeah, so I um, I always knew I wanted to go into broadcasting. Since I was like nine or ten years old, I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. I think my whole life I assumed I would be a sideline reporter or a studio host or, or things like that because that's kind of all that all that I saw women doing in the industry. Right. So yep. I go to Northwestern, uh, play volleyball, I study journalism, and I graduated in March of 2020. So quite literally the worst possible time to try to break into sports when you know sports are essentially canceled, nothing's happening in the world. Um, even when people say they're hiring, they're not. You know, playing volleyball too, I, I wasn't able to join you know, all the clubs um, to do TV and radio and all these things that a lot of, you know, college students are able to do to build up a reel. Because the first thing, you know, a producer tells you when you want to connect about a job is send me a reel. So I didn't have that. Uh, so I was supposed to spend kind of the senior semester um, of my spring quarter, you know, building up a reel so I could send out to people. And, you know, COVID hits, I'm living in my mom's basement, um, trying to look for jobs. And, you know, at a time that obviously was like really sad, no sports were going on. And I kind of had to re kind of commit myself to this dream that I've had since I was a little girl. And that was to be a broadcaster. So I kind of told myself, you know, if there's no one hiring or I can't, you know, do that for a publication or a team or a network, I'm just going to do it on my own. So I started a web show slash podcast. It was called Big Ten Volley Talk. And I would interview Big Ten Volleyball uh, athletes, coaches, alumni, just a bunch of people around um, Big Ten Volleyball that, you know, I could highlight their personalities and talk through some big games and, you know, showcase these athletes in a way that they hadn't really before. And that was, you know, three, four years ago, three and a half years ago. And, and it's crazy thinking back to then there were no really people in the space that were doing it on a big platform. You know, I think of now there's, there's still a few outlets that are, um, you know, doing interviews and highlighting these players and doing digital content. But at the time there was really no one. So I thought that that could be a really good niche for me, someone who had played the sport and knows it really well, and also to just get some reps for myself. So I started this web show. I pitched it to volleyballmag.com as a digital series and kind of told them, hey, you know, you don't have any female voices on this platform. Also, your digital uh, space could use a little bit of help. You know, I can fill both of those roles with what I've been doing here. So they picked that up as a digital series. We expanded it to all of the NCAA. And this was in the fall of 2021 or 2020 where the Big Ten season got pushed to the spring. So, you know, I had picked up um, a side job working as a social media coordinator for a, an internship place that I interned in, in college and on the side was doing these interviews and, you know, I was constantly pitching myself places. And one of those was Athletes Unlimited, who was having their first ever professional women's indoor volleyball season in the winter of 2021. They wanted, they didn't really want to pay someone that much. I didn't have any experience. So it was a perfect fit of yeah. me getting so much experience, spending eight weeks in a bubble in Dallas covering, um, you know, one of the first ever professional women's indoor volleyball leagues. I got to do pregame interviews, postgame interviews. I hosted a weekly show um, with someone and I got a lot of reps doing all of that. And, and from there, I started pitching myself to other places. And that was when I pitched myself to Big Ten Network of saying, hey, you know, I've been doing this for Athletes Unlimited. Um, I would love to cover the NCAA tournament that was all happening, you know, within a two week span in Omaha. And I said, I, I will do pregame, I'll do, you know, previews, recaps, interviews with players, uh, whatever you want me to do. And I'll go cover it, you know, from the inside when, you know, there weren't a lot of people there and no one was giving that coverage to volleyball at the time. And they were looking to expand their volleyball coverage. 
So they said, okay, we'll, we'll send you to Omaha for two weeks. And I don't think I slept those entire two weeks or 10 days or whatever it was, you know, just churning out so much content. And, um, from then I kind of started having conversations with, you know, people on the TV side for putting me on games. And, um, I actually ended up on a game a few weeks before that tournament and I didn't think it was very good, but I guess they saw some potential in me. Um, and brought me on as a color commentator for that next fall in 2021. And we're also at the time looking for digital hosts to not only cover volleyball, but, you know, all the sports that Big Ten Network covers. Um, you know, I, I do some with football and basketball and, and wrestling and, and all these things. So, you know, it was kind of a, a period of time where I felt like I had to not convince people, but really put myself out there of the work that I was doing and the work that I wanted to do and continually push for one more coverage in the volleyball space, but two, me being, me being that person to do it. Um, and since then I've, you know, become big 10 networks lead volleyball analyst, um, for games and the networks, this is my third year as their digital host. Um, and now also have expanded to ESPN where I'm in my, I just did my second season, um, for them as well. <laughs> that makes my head spin just, I mean, cause I feel like when we, when we met, I was like, I went back and told Haley, our director at the time, cause we were trying in South Dakota, um, you know, and promoting volleyball in South Dakota. And we just happened to have this pretty good player on our way up. Um, and that we were, you know, learning more about the national scene and, went down there um once it was in omaha but then uh been friends with coach skinner in kentucky for uh you know forever so that was pretty cool to see but then watching you is it was almost like oh yeah we'll just follow this person <laughs> and then continuous like so i tell everyone interview uh intern that we have i'm like just go follow emily go back to when she was starting you want to know how to get into this business this is what you do but Talk, I mean, that initiative, I use the word, you have to have initiative. Yeah. I mean, man, that initiative that you showed, it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, part of that is having, there's a big, big factor of that is kind of just that internal motivation. And like, when I want something, I'm going to absolutely go after it. Um, if I really feel strongly about it. And again, I kind of made that commitment to myself of, you know, I've had this dream since I was nine years old to be a sports broadcaster. And if no one's going to hire me or if no one is hiring me um, or no one's hiring in general at the time, I got to figure out a way for myself. And, you know, something that I, I tell aspiring broadcasters a lot is that one reps are the most important thing, but it also doesn't really matter how you're getting those reps. It doesn't have to be for it. You don't have to be tied to a network, a team or a league to get reps. You know, social media exists for a reason. You can go out there, start a podcast on your own, start a web show, just start posting videos, you know, TikToks, reels to social media, and you never know who's going to see it. You know, you can get those reps. And also one video could be your next break to someone contacting you about, you know, wanting you to do this on a bigger platform or gaining a lot of recognition or a following or having really high engagement. Um, for me, it worked out because it was at a time that I identified where the sport was exploding and there was no one in this space doing it. So me, I knew volleyball really well and I could get in early with it. And for me, I've just been really lucky to be able to, you know, ride the wave of the sport exploding. And, and if I've had any hand in that, I'm very thankful. Um, but I'm just really thankful to be a part of the sport at a time where it's just skyrocketing. Yeah. I, I say that too, as somebody who came late to the game, <clears throat> but I ask people lifers, I'm like, what do you think now? I mean, is this something you guys dreamed about? Cause I, I haven't known anything different. Um, yeah. we jumped in at the perfect time, even in South Dakota to watch how it's gone crazy and, and really surpassed basketball in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. But so to me, it's always had the momentum, the the rise, the numbers. But I asked lifers, I'm like, 10 years ago, did you dream? I mean, you probably dreamed of this. Did you ever think this would happen? And I'm like, I, I just don't know any different, but it's pretty dang cool. Yeah, it's huge. And I think a big part of that, you know, comes from when you're growing a sport, the biggest thing is TV. Initially, you have to have games on TV so people actually know what's happening and can watch it. 
where volleyball has benefited from that is one, having really good people in charge of some of these networks that genuinely care and understand the sport. And even just knowing from a production standpoint, like the angles that work and, and all of that, but just that investment piece from the top, you know, the coordinating producer at Big Ten Network, Sue Marriott, the coordinating producer at ESPN, Erica Galbraith, two people that are in charge of essentially almost all the coverage of the sport in the U.S. They're the ones making that really big push. I think the second part is that when this sport is on TV and say you're just flipping through the channels, um, it's really hard to turn off because of how fast it is and because of how impressive the athletes look. You know, they're athletic yet graceful. They're powerful. Um, it's so fun to watch and really hard to turn away from because it's so quick. You watch a football game, you you know, you got 30 seconds in between each snap and there's a lot of dead time and you feel like you can get up and go grab some water before the next play starts. Volleyball is not like that. You know, it, it is quick. It is bang, bang. They're going from point to point. Yeah, you get a timeout 15 points in, but it takes a long time to get there normally. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of my, my push was this, even, you know, where I live in South Dakota back in the days watching the state tournament. And this is no disrespect, but if I'm a new fan, I would watch somebody who literally is a basketball broadcaster. They, mm -hmm. yeah, I've watched more volleyball than they have. Right. And so that was part of it. I, I always thought in order for the growth, the product on TV has to be better and you have to know the game, right? People have asked me, I, I can't do volleyball play by play. I can do football and do basketball. I don't know volleyball well enough, but it wasn't as entertaining because you had people that didn't know the game doing the few TV games that they had. And so now I, I think anyways, part of the entertainment is you're actually getting more people that have a big volleyball background broadcasting volleyball matches. Yeah, that's a huge part of it. You know, I think volleyball, even thinking back a few years ago when I, when I started doing TV, you know, a lot of people that I would work with as um, play by plays, it was kind of a stepping stone for them of, okay, we'll, we'll try you out on volleyball. And then eventually if you do well with this, we'll put you on basketball and football and those things, which is still somewhat the case. But I think it's different now, even having conversations with some of my play by play partners of, you know, they've always, of course, probably had goals of, you know, calling the NFL or NBA games or college football or all these things. But now they really, really like volleyball and want to stay in the space as long as they can and, you know, sometimes aren't willing to give up those games. Even people that I know that have been wildly successful that are calling, you know, men's professional games, they still want to call volleyball matches because they're so much fun to call and they understand it more. Um, and I think it does make a really big difference in terms of the product. And I think the quality of analysts we have now as well, as the sports exploded and more games are on TV, I think these producers are also doing a good job of, you know, connecting people that really want to be a viable analyst or maybe could be a viable analyst, whether it's a former player or um, someone who just knows the sport really well and converting them into a good analyst, um, which is something I agree that, you know, 10 years ago we didn't necessarily have because there weren't many games on TV. Let, let me ask you this before we go to break and, and switch topics, but what would you what would you suggest um i know a lot of times in you know in football in basketball they'll take commentators or color commentators a lot of times based on their name or their resume if it's somebody that wasn't an all-american national champion right yeah, what what do you do to show yourself out to get an opportunity where others may get an opportunity just simply based on their name? Yeah, I mean, look, it's always going to happen. You know, you're always going to have the national player of the year and they're done and finished up. You know, of course, people would love to have them on a broadcast because of the name recognition. We've seen it from time to time. A lot of times it doesn't pan out. You'll put them on the mic and they do not work well on the mic. Um, but coming from me, someone who was a walk on at Northwestern, um, you know, parents were paying my way through school. I never played until my senior year and we had a lot of injuries. You know, I rode the bench really hard for nearly four straight years. And I think for me, what I did during that time and maybe something that I hadn't noticed as much was being on the sidelines. I had a different view of the game where as a libero, I wasn't just focused on, um, you know, where I had to be in certain defensive positions, whoever's getting set or where we were in serve receive. Like I could take a step back and really look at the game and see how it was unfolding in front of me, which 
I think actually happened to be really beneficial for me to where I understood other positions a lot better than maybe I would have if I were on the court. Um, but now what I, what I channel that into is I always wanted to be, you know, someone who knew the scout the best. Um, I wanted to learn what to do in what situation just in case it came up or honestly to help my teammates out who were on the court, say a, a setter or a middle came off and I could help them out. Um, maybe if someone wasn't, but now I kind of channel that into scouting teams. So I pride myself on prep. I would argue that I'm one of the most prepared analysts in the entire game. Um, I spend countless hours preparing for games that I probably don't need to do, but I'm just so wired to do that. Um, and I think that makes me stand out because I know in what situations, what teams want to run, who's going to get the ball, where they're hitting the ball, what a setter likes to do in, you know, whatever's unfolding in front of her, um, you know, where the defense is set up and what adjustments they're making and all these things that really you can tell, at least I can tell when an analyst doesn't do that work. And when, you know, maybe they only know the team's names um, and, you know, they're just watching the the play unfold in front of them. So what I do is I really try to out prep everyone. And then the second part of it is in terms of just delivery and broadcasting skills, I wanted to make sure that I sound the most fine tuned in terms of actual broadcasting so that if maybe I don't know as much as, you know, the Olympian that's, you know, in the booth next to me or whoever's doing another game, maybe I don't know as much as them in terms of volleyball, but I'm going to present it in a better way to where I sound like I do. Uh, so that's a big point of emphasis for me. I've been working with a talent coach for about two years. Uh, her name is Jill Montgomery. She's very hard on me, uh, but in the best way. I love that kind of coaching. And we break down my game film after every single game I do. And I watch every game back, um, which takes a lot of hours when you're doing about three games a week. Uh, but I want to get better. And the only way to get better is to watch the film and listen to yourself as uncomfortable as it may be. Um, yeah. But that's my way that I try to be, you know, better than, you know, whatever analyst um, is doing a different game. I want to sound better and I want to be a lot more prepared. That's awesome stuff. Uh, right now, we're going to take a take a break and come back with more with Emily and uh, and talk a little bit about the game today. But first, uh, let's stop for our weekly segment, and that's our spotlight athlete profiles again from VBAdrenaline.com, and these are some of our growing lists of incredible athletes that. You know, it's a little mini resume for them, so you can follow their journey throughout their recruiting process. And let's take a look at this week's three top spotlight athlete profiles.
Okay, everybody, again, uh, congratulations to those athletes. And like I said, every week we get more and more big-time prospects uh, signing up, and it's going to be cool to follow their journey. So if you want your own uh, athlete spotlight, go to vbadrenaline.com, fill that out, and you can update that as often as you like throughout your uh, recruiting process all the way through signing day. So, again, I'm joined with Emily Eamon, Big Ten Network, ESPN, uh, amongst other things, crushing it in the volleyball world and really has become, I think, the face of the face of volleyball in a lot of ways um, at the collegiate level. Um, but Emily, let's talk, talked about your career. Let's talk about the game now. You yeah. already mentioned the 92,000 uh, person match. What is good about the explosion of volleyball right now? Oh, there's so much good things. I think from a lot of different aspects, I, I think it's great because we're highlighting these players who haven't necessarily had that before. I also think social media is really helpful for that. You know, I, I talk with some coaches. So, for example, someone like Kelly Sheffield, he's always uh, he has his ideas that he thinks can grow the sport. And something I talk to him about a lot, and we don't as the media in volleyball and media in general, we don't do a really good job at, at trying to make our athletes legends and to really build them up as stars. You know, when you think of women's basketball collegiately, who do you think of? You think of Caitlin Clark, you know, right away. She's the reason why Iowa basketball is selling out every single game, even on the road. We don't do that for volleyball. And I think it's been something we've been missing for the last, you know, five, 10 years or so, because we have absolute stars. I think we're doing a better job of it um, than we have been. But that's one way that, I think we still could could get a lot better at it is highlighting these athletes and teams and coaches. Um, and we're making a lot of progress. You know, I think we're seeing the feature pieces. We're seeing teams, social media's departments, you know, put a lot more resources and effort into that um, in a way that that's helping explode the sport. You know, we're seeing more games on TV than ever before. Viewership records for pretty much every network have been shattered year to year. You know, we're seeing viewership records in the same year, broken multiple times, attendance records. It's been so exciting for the sport to see kind of a domino effect of it just took a little bit of push, you know, a few years back to really let these dominoes fall. And now we're seeing it explode in a, you know, unprecedented way. Yeah, I love that. I love that you say that. That's <clears throat> been uh, one of our mission statements, I think, um, is putting the faces to the names or several other publications that are great about written content. Um, that was never going to be for me because anybody who's uh, read my tweets knows how many grammatical mistakes I make, <laughs> but uh, that, that wasn't going to be mine. But, uh, and the cool thing is uh, we've done some pretty cool interviews with some stars that have not gone on to college and we're like, Hey, when you get on ESPN, you remember we were your first, uh, we were your first interview, but, but, I, that's exactly what I told people was, hey, yeah, we need the games, um, but promoting the the uh, selection Sunday, right? Like yeah. that's a big deal in basketball. But there's build up. They they have people that are passionate about it. They do, you know, they do um, sentimental pieces. They do background stories on yeah. those stars, which are still ways. Um, and I want to add. That's what I want to lead into. I guess is along with continuing to promote the biggest stars in the game. What are some other things that need to be done to continue to push the needle forward? Yeah, I think there's two main things to me. One is that promotion piece and whether that's on TV or on social media, you know, I think networks are getting better at it, but there still needs to be a lot more push to watch some of these games. You know, you can have um, you know, a, a championship on ABC for the first time ever. And I thought ESPN did a great job of promoting that. But if they don't promote it, no one's going to watch because no one knows it's happening. So, you know, during the regular season, when you have these, you know, games getting bumped up, say from ESPNU to ESPN2 or 2 to, you know, the mothership, we need to know about <coughs> that, celebrate that. And, and they're doing a much better job of it. I, I think the people in charge really understand that promotion is so big for that, whether that's, you know, putting out graphics on social media or having us, you know, the volleyball talent um, tweet it or, or put it on Instagram for them. 
but also from a TV perspective, you know, we need to do a much better job of promoting this sport. For me, that starts from studio. So, you know, you turn on a uh, first take or get up in the morning and they're constantly talking about the NBA or NFL and what's happening there. When have they ever talked about volleyball? You know, even while the tournament's going on, you know, things like that. I think that we could do a much better job of promoting the sport. Um, you know, God forbid we have a five minute segment at the end of whatever promoting a huge match that's coming up or some a post game show or pre game show, things like that, that get people excited about it because they're not going to watch if they don't know it's there. So I, I think we yeah. could do a much better job of studio coverage in general. Um, you know, having people in studio who can talk about volleyball and, you know, producers that are willing to have someone in there to talk about it. Well, and I think uh, with BTN, I'm guessing you probably had a lot to do with it. You know, BTN is leading the way, um, you know, SEC needs a media day, right? Um, yeah. You know, ACC needs a media day. You guys are crushing it um, with that. And, and, and it's good. Plus, what, what we did it here, even in little South Dakota, we did a high school media day one year to copy you guys. And it was awesome because we got all of our content that we needed. We talked to all the stars. You guys rerun content from that. You just did yeah. some after the, vol after the final four. But it's like it's putting yeah. names to faces. And with football, those passionate football fans, when they see their head coach at media day, they're like, okay, opening day is getting closer. It's mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah, it, 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 is that a money thing? Is that a sponsorship thing? Is is it just not knowing? Like, what does it take to get that changed? Yeah, you know, I, I think, I mean, I was lucky to kind of join on BTN when it started becoming uh, in the work. So, you know, our coordinating producer, Sue Marriott, and our TV rep at the conference, uh, Grace McNamara, they did a phenomenal job of kind of putting it together. And to be honest, I think a big reason why it works in the Big Ten is because there's so much interest from local media that wants to come, or really even national media. When you have teams like Nebraska, Penn State, um, Wisconsin, like these household volleyball names that people know, it, it helps when you have media coverage for them. You know, I, I'm not sure that if at this point in time, if you had – an ACC volleyball media days and put them all in one spot. Like, I don't know really what the turnout would be. And maybe, I, maybe we'd all be surprised. And I, I would hope so that that's the case. But I think because the big 10, honestly, specifically Nebraska and Wisconsin have such a big following and so many local and national media personnel following them, that that fills a room and it's really difficult. You know, maybe I do think that, conferences should at least do it on zoom so that you know you have you know players out there that are getting their stories out there but I mean it's been huge for us to have them in person and it's it's honestly it's such a cool event I mean there isn't very often in any sport where you get to see people and players and coaches from every single team in one room together you know maybe for a like a conference basketball tournament but people still have you know buys so they don't they're not actually in the same room together um but it's so cool to have them all in the same room on one day. You know, we do every year we've done a dinner on that first night that's just, you know, the players and coaches and conference and network reps. And it's the coolest thing to see them all mingle and get together. And, you know, players that you didn't know were friends or coaches that you had no idea were close, just like whooping it up all night. Um, it's the best. But again, I, I don't know if that's at this point something that could easily be replicated in other conferences just because I, I don't know if the interest is there and I really hope it is. I think from what we've seen for some specific teams, it very much is, but I hope we do get to a point where I can say, yeah, hands down. I know that, you know, 50 media personnel would go to ACC or SEC um, big 12 media days. Right. Right. <clears throat> but I do think uh, competition brings that out. And I see somebody like a yeah. DBK or, or fish, you know, the ACC, it's like, okay, we're sick of everybody talking about the B big 10, like pushing yeah. for that. And now, uh, you know, Texas hopping into the SEC, um, you get <clears throat> some of that. And, but it's kind of like people were like, well, you know, you have to, you have to try these things to do year one, to make it, to make the mistakes and learn from them yeah. for it to become, you know, SEC football media days didn't become that, I, I guess, overnight. Uh, my, my thing is, is the pregame. I would love to see a final four pregame 
uh, pre-match show uh, that's more than just a, you know a few minutes. Uh, yeah. I mean, you remember as a kid, whether it was basketball or football, getting up, you know, for your favorite team, Wisconsin, Nebraska, end of the year, like one versus two. There was this buzz on social media, like it'd be so cool to have an hour pregame for that yeah. and the build up all week. Um, I agree. I think we're moving that way, though. I do. I yeah, really do. I, I think we're we're getting there, and again, it takes so much buy in from the people at the top to really put in that promotion and put in the resources for it. And, and that game's a great example. Um, I remember, so I actually called that game, the one versus two undefeated and it was in Nebraska and there was actually a football game that same day. And this was the first time they had ever done this, but they actually, during the football game, it was Nebraska Northwestern. They had me go to the football stadium and do an interview during the football game, like while play was going on, uh, which they had never done before, just to promote that match that was coming up. And I thought that was the coolest thing because it ended up, you know, drawing a lot of viewers there. At least they knew about the game. And I know constantly, you know, our play by play reads through promos, you know, after every timeout and break and whatever. Um, it's constantly getting promos in. And I know they had like 10 promos during that game alone just for the game that night. Um, and we had talked and, and floated around the idea of a studio show. I, I don't think it made sense with football timing and, you know, they've got a lot to figure out there in terms of, of timing and what we're actually able to do. But I agree. I think it would be great to have a pregame show lead in because um, now so often we actually do have a studio show after games or at least someone on the it's called, you know, uh, it's Big Ten today or the big show after games. They'll have a volleyball analyst on there. But like, how cool would it be if, you know, we had a set down there and I could just, you know, take my headset off and go join the set or, or things like that. And, and I think that's one thing that we're still missing, but I think we're, we're starting to get there. Yeah, I do too. I, and I'm working on, I'm working on a big idea for the final four. You'll probably be busy next year, but I'll definitely um, give you a shout out if it goes through. So I, <laughs> my, uh, my little cameras, right. But I think, I, I, I think we came upon something at this year's final four that'll, uh, that we're moving in that direction just because we talked about how big it was and the fan, uh, the fan zone behind it. I, I, it's just such a cool time to see all these new things, but then people doing them at an excellent level, like you do, um, you know, yeah. and, uh, kudos to you. It's, um, we can talk volleyball for another uh, couple hours here, I'm sure. But, but what, um, what, so what do you do as we wrap up? What do you do now as you wait for big 10 media days, uh, next August, what will you be up to? That is a great question. Uh, I have spent the last two weeks doing absolutely nothing and it's been amazing. Um, actually I got my wisdom teeth out about 10 days ago, so I'm still kind of recovering from that, but I have, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the off season for me too. So, you know, hopefully we have a, a new pro league starting up PVF in about, almost a week now it's coming up really quick um so i'm hoping to be involved with the league in some capacity um so hopefully either calling games or doing content for them we'll see still finalizing some stuff um so we'll have that and then this summer i'll actually be traveling with a volleyball world and covering vnl so volleyball nations league following team usa around to their stops around the world um and calling those professional vnl matches and then then it kind of leads us right into the fall. So that'll be about seven weeks in the summer. Um, I also still do content for Big Ten Network in the off season. And like you mentioned for media days, it's a great opportunity for us because we get content that we can use year round. You know, it's not just content that we can use two weeks after media days is done. You know, we have those players and coaches sitting in there asking them, you know, what's your dream vacation? Like all these questions that we can use year round. So it's nice to continually put out content in that space. Um, so we have a lot that we still haven't put out for media days. Um, I'm sure I'll do a lot more pieces coming up, um, looking ahead to the fall over the next few months. And I'll honestly just enjoying some downtime and, and taking, taking some vacations, which I'm excited about. But this is my off season and I'm, I'm excited to enjoy it a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and you've uh, definitely earned it, and, and we thank you for your time. And it's been uh, so cool just watching you continue to crush things and grow the sport. And I I think, like I said, with our uh, interns, we talk about what you're doing all the time and, and the career path, uh, sh showing others that maybe want to do what you're doing. Um, 
I think is pretty cool. And so, uh, Emily, thank you so much for your time. Uh, did you record one of those? Um, did you record one of the post wisdom teeth, um, <laughs> reels while you're still drugged up you know, or no? Luckily I wasn't too crazy after they like fully put me under. So it wasn't like the laughing gas situation. I do have some funny pictures my mom took, but I was like pretty okay. Weirdly enough, I was really worried. I was going to say something a little bit out of pocket. Um, so that didn't happen and we didn't get canceled. So that's great. That's a win. <laughs> They're like, just take your phone away until two yeah. days after the, uh, the procedure. But I told my awesome. mom that and I was like, take if I asked for my phone, I was like, just don't give it to me. Just take it for the day. I don't need it. We're good. What life will be good if I don't get the post wisdom <laughs> teeth, uh, uh, tick tock. So, well, Emily, thank you for your time. And it's been so cool watching you. We will definitely see you, um, down the road and continue to push for greatness in volleyball. Okay. Thank you. It was, it was so fun to be on here and I, I appreciate everything you guys do pushing the sport forward as well. It's, it's fun to have, you know, friendly faces in the space. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. It is for sure. Hey, everybody, that, that'll do it for another episode of VB Adrenaline uh, Podcast. You can check us out on Instagram, where we continue to really grow rapidly. It's been cool, uh, at vbadrenaline.com underscore, and on the X, at VB Adrenaline. Check us out. we got some big-time uh, Triple Crown NIT coverage coming up and lots, lots more as uh, the club season is off and rolling, and that means recruiting is going to heat up here in a bit. So we thank you for tuning in. We thank you for Emily, and we'll see you all soon.